Far Cry 4 is a really weird game. And it's not a weird game for the reasons a game is normally called weird. It's not intentionally absurd like Calm Down Stalin, nor is it like the works of Kitty Horror Show, which are at once surreal, horrific, and existential. No, I'm calling it weird because it seems heavily invested in seeming heavily invested in a narrative. A narrative it refers to flits towards like moth to a flame before fleeing the singeing light of having an opinion and concluding that nothing matters. Nothing could matter. And maybe you shouldn't have given a shit in the first place. And you know what, that's a bit harsh, so I'm going to start off with the positives. What I like about this game, I've played it for like 30-40 hours, so clearly I like it on some level. And I do! From a mechanical perspective, it's a lot of fun. Combat is top notch, I've always loved the combat system of Far Cry, the shooting and the takedowns and the looting. I'm a huge fan of how this particular game is so well suited towards a stealth based approach, with multiple angles of attack for every base. You weave around like an avenging ghost, hacking people apart, shooting them from the shadows, disabling their alarms so they can't call for reinforcements, and it is excellent. And when you have to go hot, it's fun too, with turrets and trucks and explosives galore. It's also a general improvement in terms of gameplay over its predecessor. You're more mobile, the wingsuits and parachutes are easier to get, and the game encourages you, with its incredibly mountainous terrain, to hop and leap and jump about. It's a lot of fun. It's also clear to me that they did a good job crafting these environments to be interesting and fun and exciting to explore through all the different methods you have at your disposal. I don't really fast travel a lot in this game because I like driving down the dirt roads. I like hang gliding and gyrocoptering around, throwing grenades over fences, molotovs at cars, and riding my way into battle on an elephant. It's a lot of fun, and you can tell they spent a lot of time working on those parts of the game. Right. Let's get into the stuff I want to talk about. Far Cry 4 takes place in Kirat, a country ambiguously within the Himalayas based on Bhutan, Tibet, and Nepal. This nation is ruled by Pagan Min, a former gang leader turned king. He's resisted by the Golden Path, often described as a two-headed elephant, in that it has two leaders who often vehemently disagree, Amita and Sabal. The main character is Ajay Gale, or A.J. Gale. A Kirati American who's visiting for the first time, and it goes terribly wrong for him. Or terribly right. So the world feels very shallow and fake. I don't mean that the graphics are outdated or something, but that the devs didn't care about making it all fit together. Morrowind is a lived in world and it has all of three faces. It's not about graphics, it's about making a world where everything connects, where Logical consequences occur and you can see how the puzzle pieces fit together, where the society is developed and its various parts lock together. It's the difference between a world where religion, social life, and politics all push and pull against each other, and one where they exist independently, pillars in the sand. Problem is, they did that for the shooty shooty bits, the drivey drivey bits, all of which come together very well, but failed to do it for the culture and people of Kirath. And this has severe consequences for the game. See, this is unambiguously a political narrative they're telling. I, I don't want to see a single comment about how it's just a shooting game. This game has characters telling you to your face their political ideologies, values, and reasons for fighting against a tyrannical dictator. There's politics in this game. And you frankly have no idea what you're fighting for. You know what you're fighting against, the religious oppression and totalitarian police state of Pagan Min. You get ample lectures on the importance of tradition or modernization, but it never feels like a real country with real people you are fighting for. What little time you spend in the towns, they still feel very dead at most a few people, rarely doing much of anything. There are, of course, concessions made to a video game. I'm willing to grant the technology to simulate vibrant city life might not have all been there, 
and there are vague attempts at it, but as I go through the game, there's never a moment where it feels like Kirat is a place actually affected by war or with a history and culture all of its own. As far as it seems, the war in Kirat not only has been raging for a long time, but Kirat itself was solely designed only for the war that the game has within it. You get very few glimpses into daily life, your interactions with civilians are them relegated to giving you missions, there is not really a sense that they have agency themselves. Some mission choices seem eclectic and randomly chosen, fashion zones in a war zone, a movie industry devoted to jackass style movies. These provide a disconnect, somehow Kirat is both ravaged by war and able to have movies made within its borders as opposed to, say, propaganda films or capturing the horror of war to appeal for international aid, you play a bunch of stunts. And the rest of the world itself only has a few NPCs you ever talk to and know at length, though you really don't have a conversation with any of them, they just kind of talk to you. The rest provide passing comments at best, and you never get to know what life is really like for most people. They're tortured, and they're beaten down, and they're oppressed, and they're shot at, but you never really understand what life could be like, what they're doing when there isn't war right outside their doorstep. There's wandering merchants, but they're all the same model and say the same things. There doesn't seem to be life outside the war, the arena is the closest thing to a social event that takes place. Presumably everyone is either in an army killing each other, wandering around villages aimlessly, or watching people butcher each other. There aren't children playing even, outside Badra who is so lacking in agency she outright tells you to choose her entire future for her. Kirat's history is lacking, stilted, communicated through journals that only barely provide a few paragraphs of historical context. It is seemingly just an island in the mountains, cut off from the world and preserved in civil war in perfect stasis, until you come along and make history for them. And what history you do make, for it seems like everyone was incompetently running around with their thumbs up their asses for years until some random American comes along. There is so much missing from Kirat and they only ever show you a few glimpses of what could be, of people, of culture, and when they try to show it off at length, what sticks out most to me is how disconnected the parts they have considered stand apart from each other and from the parts they have not considered. I think this is a good chance to discuss religion in this game, as it is the one thing we spend quite a bit of time looking at. The game seems to position religion as central to Kirati life and culture. Pagan Min is destroying religious icons to demoralize people. Multiple references are made to how important religion is. I mean, the image most associated with this game is Pagan Min in a pink suit sitting atop a destroyed icon. Clearly, we're meant to see it as important. But there's an insidious framing here that really eats away at the idea that the game wants you to consider it important or worthy of respect. We learn about Kirati religion in two ways. One, you uh, hallucinate yourself traveling through a demon infested land, either through your enemies drugging you or the sheer power of scrolls making you see things. You've hallucinations of mythology, Pagan Min's second in command is obsessive in her searches for a source of magic power, and her psychedelic combat sequence pits her as the hero of Kirati mythology against you. Hallucinations of religious icons and symbolism aren't unheard of, but they are so common in this game and serve as such a vehicle for exposition. They may as well be the primary source this game uses to convey spirituality. And as for what we're directly told about Kirati religion, it's not much better. One level where you're told to explicitly learn what the main character's father was fighting for, as you explore this temple in a cave complex full of anonymous worshippers who sacrifice animals and whisper about how you're allowed to see this. A preacher will list off symbolisms and meanings of ritual. 
none of which have any relevance to the game or its themes, and all of which are forgotten the moment shooting starts again. It invokes a lot of imagery pulled from myriad sources, plucking specifically only that which will seem foreign and bizarre to this game's mostly western audience. You're tasked with understanding the culture and religion of the people you are here to fight for, and it becomes clear the writers didn't care to make religion that is woven into society, with no sense of how these traditions supposedly hold Kirat together. It is really gross, actually. It's another example of a western piece of media completely misunderstanding, misapplying, and misusing the aesthetic of a vaguely quote eastern unquote religion for the purposes of seeming mystical, strange, foreign, and dangerous. It doesn't help that you never actually need to contend with this in the game. The few levels where you play and engage with spirituality are short and the game wants them to be over as soon as possible. There could have been space here, there are glimmers where it might have worked. You see people mourning the dead and cremating them, and that could have been expanded. Side missions where you recover relics and heirlooms for families. Side missions where you help the citizens of Kirat get food and water to a temple that serves as a place of refuge. Things that show there's a vibrancy, a life to religious practice. But no, religion in Kirat is shown to be shallow, easy to ignore, and violent is presented to be delegitimized, and where it is useful, it is only useful insofar as people can use it for war. Weapons are stored for temples hidden inside their bunker-like caves, and this makes every appeal to religion, every claim there is something important, something meaningful here, fall flat, at least for me. And so, with a world that doesn't feel lived in, a culture that's only developed so far as to fit within a utilitarian story, the question of what you are fighting for is best answered by looking at the two leaders of the Golden Path. This game positions you as the Mega Napoleon Che Guevara Hyper Mega Chad who can pick up a gun and start blasting away. Despite this, your influence is limited to who you decide to do the blasting for and the ideological vision that you support. Now the problem is, is that both of the leaders that you can choose between, Sabal and Amita, suck. And they suck in a way that is really fascinating. Sabal is an ultra-traditionalist theocrat. I've already talked about how religion in this game is interpreted and framed, so I will not waste your time talking about it again. But when you base an entire character off of their love and respect for something that you also frame as dark, violent, and fueled by hallucinations, you are not going to ingratiate them to the audience. Unless you're going for like a very specific niche ultra-nationalist theocratic gamer market, he is a pretty alienating character. And of course he does murder everyone who disagrees with him, so that's a wash. Amita, who I'll spend much more time talking about, seems frankly written to prey on players who may have a soul and may care about things. She tells you about how she was the first woman soldier in the Golden Path, how she was abused by her parents and their attempts to force her into a child marriage. She talks about her vision for modernizing Kirat, using drugs, and she begs you to preserve the opium fields in the factories, M hopes you can understand that by doing this bad thing you can build up the country, obtain wealth, make clinics and schools, you do something awful but for the benefit of everyone. And you know what? That alone is a fascinating character right there. A character who has ideals and vision but understands that there's a grim, cold, pragmatic reality to factor in. You don't see anything to counter her claims that Kirat is poor and broken, outside slaves and chain gangs who break rocks and references to long dried up gold mines. Unless Kirat would become entirely funded by tourists or given a good dose of shock doctrine, we aren't really given much of an insight into how it can function as an independent economy. So I'm quite down with Amita as a character and a moral quandary. But then the game drops the ball. It does this by making Amita do a heel face turn into authoritarian narco state stuff where she's stealing children and ruining their lives to grow opium. And you know, maybe you can say 
you should have seen this coming, but I would have found it much more fascinating if she was an honest character who was making you consider the actual moral implications of what you're doing, as opposed to just becoming a dictator who destroys everything and has been lying to you the whole time. You know, a big problem is that you're never really given a much of an indication as to her intentions. Obviously, the drugs, yes, but given how much she emphasizes modernization, her own pain, and how that feeds into her desire for a better world, it feels like she was a genuine and honest person who just then turns and lies to you and collapses her entire story. One can't really milk their childhood for sympathy before turning around and ruining hundreds of children's lives without seeming very hypocritical. And in a story that has a very fascinating moral quandary such as Amita's, that hypocrisy just makes everything fall flat. So it kind of ends up feeling like you're meant to side with her, but it also turns out that you're evil and you were wrong for siding with her. I would also like to point out that the first indication the revolution is going sideways is during a psychedelic hallucination sequence, and then you are told to choose who will rule, and then you kill the person that you didn't choose to rule. All of this in the last... four hours of a roughly 20 hour game? There's not really a build-up or explanation or any attempt at mediation, just bluntly being told to kill someone and then being told by the person you worked for that they were evil too and you made the wrong choice either way. It really does seem like Kirad has no future, none worth creating anyways. And what's funny is the game kind of admits as much. In one side mission where you defend a truck and... Listen to the driver ramble, this line gets dropped. Presenting the player with this binary between Sabal and Amita, and having them both turn out to be evil, cruel, and dictatorial, has led to the fan interpretation that the true good guy of the game is Pagan Min. Now, I'm not here to claim this is a common interpretation, nor is it one that I agree with, but one can look and pretty easily find people justifying for the dictator, saying he's not that bad. And you know, I sort of understand it. He's affable, funny, he references Kanye West and is one of the most honest and open actors of the principal characters, outright telling you everything you need to know about your family history and what happened to your mother and father. But, you know, thinking about it for a second, it's an absurdist take. He is a totalitarian monster, and just because he was worse in the past doesn't mean the sins he committed are justified now. There is no way he's the good guy. But of the presented options, with the Golden Path reduced to one or two strongholds, it's undeniable that Ajay siding with anyone in the Golden Path results in a much longer, more painful conflict. The Golden Path comes out on top, but at the cost of prolonging the civil war with no good end for Kirat. And that fact does produce a story quandary. What are we meant to derive from Far Cry 4's narrative? Every option for the revolution sucks, but letting a despotic dictator reign unchallenged is hardly good. So, here's my best attempt at piecing together Far Cry 4. Tradition is a terrible way to rule. To follow blindly in the footsteps of the past is to ossify and become unable to move forwards. Progress will demand to happen, and resistance to the inevitable will be violent and brutal, out of place and out of touch. A better world is not possible. Don't listen to people who've been hurt. Don't listen to people who want to improve things. They are liars. They are snakes. They don't believe their own words, and they will use you. Fighting for a better world means that you're fighting for someone else to get power, to be used, abused, and thrown away once they are done with you. A better world is not possible, and you are a fool for thinking it is. And when it comes to totalitarian dictators, well, yeah, they, they are bad. 
but they're the ones who won't lie to your face. It might just be best to leave them alone. After all, it could get so much worse. You can either get in line or get out of the way. So the game doesn't want you to think about this, I don't think. I mean, I'm not saying that in a conspiratorial way. I'm saying that in a this game is fundamentally not interested in itself way. It touches on a lot of topics, but it doesn't commit to any idea. It just displays them. It insists that Pagan is bad, but it presents no other viable option. It tries to show a society that is deeply traditional, but barely understands what tradition is beyond symbols, superstition, and hallucination. To have a CIA agent betray and hurt you all while displaying a deeply racist and American chauvinist attitude. Look at you. American on the inside and useful on the outside. You're the perfect wolf in sheep herder's clothing. Way better than the so-called douchebag at the babysitter my last job. But it never really digs into how CIA influence works or how it harms a nation or a movement. The Golden Path suffers no ill consequences, what harm is done to you is patched over and you move on. It constantly displays imagery and ideas with such little interest that they stop mattering the second they leave the screen. That temple scene that I have so much spite for, it lasts two, maybe three minutes before you're plunged into an intense combat sequence and then you don't need to go back, ever again. A glimpse of life under Pagan's regime is followed by a high-speed action chase and then the town is assumed to be under Golden Path control. And over and over again this happens, you're plunged from scene to scene, never without action or combat, into a delirious and constant feeling of movement. From fortress to fortress, outpost to outpost, cover to cover, you time your shots, you take down enemies. Every few minutes your gun is blasting down some poor soldiers, and it is fun. That is how this game works. It keeps you so engrossed in the action you can't consider the world, because if you did, what would come across is how thoughtless a lot of it is. This isn't going to be a one-off thing. It hasn't been a one-off thing. Far Cry has always sort of been like this, pulling from different sources and compiling something that passes as a narrative if you don't think about it too hard. And the reason I'm not talking about 3 or 5 here is because I'd be offering broadly similar critiques just rephrased for the new setting it takes place in. If you remember my video on revolutions in video games, you'll remember the main thrust of that video was the assertion that games tend to be dominated by a great man theory of history. And that is in droves here. But something I didn't talk about was the attitude they take towards revolutions in the first place, and Far Cry 4 is a prime example. They just don't care. It's set dressing, a playground, child marriage, national sovereignty, the collapse of revolutions, CIA influence, all of it is set dressing for what they really care about, making a fun way to shoot guns. And you know, it doesn't take a grand conspiracy for this to happen, it just takes the inherent contradiction between the motivations of mass profit and the desire to make something complex. If we assume good faith on the part of every single member of the team and assume, for the sake of argument, that no executive was breathing down their neck, the game team still has the pressures of market, reputation, and profit motive to contend with. A game that takes hard stances and builds its narratives around these questions, as opposed to just vague gestures in the direction of dictator bad, but also violence to stop dictator bad, would be far more interesting for the group of people, like me, who really gun for good narrative, but could also alienate and drive away fans. If they embraced the inherently political nature of the narrative in either a right or left direction, people would not be as interested. This contradiction between something that makes complex, difficult topics and the central part of the game, and making something that appeals to as many people as possible is on full flagrant display. And of course, I want to emphasize that is all assuming there weren't fingers in the pie when it came to executive meddling, an assumption that seems almost too generous. But even still, to so flagrantly not care about the questions they raise, to shrug off the possibility for something interesting, to use the very real problems of the world to try and tug at emotions, and then leave it up in the air with nothing to show for it, or worse, to say that fighting to fix these issues is wrong, is just 
such a fucking disappointment. Even keeping the whole revolution is doomed aspect, there could have been more. What could have been an excellent narrative about revolution? What could have been with a bit more thought, something with legitimately interesting questions to ask and moral conundrums to consider, is all wasted. And instead, we get a shallow, orientalist, cloyingly close to decent story that ends with us wondering what the point even was. It's almost nihilistic, really. But with how surprised the main character is when everything goes wrong, how he still believes until the end that he's doing something right, it seems they didn't care enough to make it that, either. There must be a cleansing for us to move forward, brother. Eventually the Tarun Matara will understand that. Thank you for watching. I would particularly like to thank my $10 patron Patrick and my $5 patrons Alicia Escobar and Rita Audrey Jones. If you liked the video, you can like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really liked it, please consider joining the names currently scrolling by by subscribing to my Patreon. That's all for now. Thank you and have a good day.